Hi everybody, it's Michaela again, and I'm here with Mr. Nigel Mogg. Hello. Nigel Mogg has been with the Choir Boys and Nancy Boy and the Peckham Cowboys with Timo Calcio, who I already interviewed, and he is currently the frontman of The Brutalists. Yes. A wonderful local band yeah. here in LA, and they actually just toured over over in the United Kingdom. Thank you so much for coming on, yes, Nigel. Yes, thank you for having me. I was trying to get the gum out of my mouth. There you go, got it. <laughs> Sorry. It's yes. okay. Um, Alrighty, so let's start from the beginning. Where were you born and raised? I'm, I'm from North London, a place called Muswell Hill, mm -hmm. uh, which is in London, in the United Kingdom. Okay. Yeah. M m most famous thing about Muswell Hill is that's where the kinks are from. Oh. Because they were actually called the Muswell Hill Hillbillies. Nice. That was their first name. And they actually did an album later on called the Muswell Hill Hillbillies. Okay. But that's about it for famous people. From, I don't know. There might be more famous people from Muswell Hill. I don't know. Okay. It's just a suburb of North London. All right. And what was your childhood like? Were you like a very bookish kid, or no, no? Well, this is gets into why I played in bands. My dad's brother, my uncle, was in a heavy metal band all the, for the '69, right through the '70s, '80s, '90s. Still going to this day, called UFO. Mm -hmm. So from a very early age, there was always records in our house, mm -hmm. and always these guys coming over mm -hmm. with long hair, platform boots, flares. Like in the early seventies, I was born in sixty five. So mm -hmm. by the time I could remember, it was probably seventy five. I was probably 10, 9, 8, 9, 10. These guys were always over. Had Michael Schenker, Pete Way, Phil Mold, my uncle, Andy Parker, the drummer. Mm -hmm. And that time, I don't know the keyboard player. Later on, Paul Raymond, the keyboard player. So there was kind of musicians around. Mm -hmm. So I've been already like conditioned to the oh, I want to do that too. <laughs> so that was kind of you know when I was young. Michael Schenker lived up the street. He would always walk his dog past us, you know. So I'd cool. see him in the street a lot. So that, so therefore, I had that kind of, oh, that's normal. That's what people do. So I want to do that too because it seemed like fun. And these guys were just dressed outrageous for, for a ten-year-old, you know, like wow, well, what? Well. And then I do remember that they had a van in England. The classic mode of transport for bands was a transit van, mm -hmm. and they had a transit van, but it had airplane seats in the back and oh, cool. I think even late not right at the beginning but later on it had a TV in it which was outrageous you know to see like I was yeah. like what the hell is that you know what I mean yeah. and but they were always coming over to borrow like jump leads and the drill or get my dad to help fix something you know what I mean so uh -huh. and of course the, uh, that was back in the days when bands made records almost like once a year mm -hmm. so every year there comes a new UFO album to listen to so I was mm -hmm. kind of heavily influenced by that kind of thing Nice. So by the time I was at school, listening to music, you know, I was into UFO and then a lot of the other heavy metal bands around the time, mm -hmm. which would be Iron Maiden and Motorhead and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, some guy in my class at school had a guitar. I was like, oh, I want one. Mm -hmm. So I got a guitar. I wasn't as good as him, so I switched to bass. And that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it started. Awesome. I know, it's all been downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, let's talk about how um, how you got into it professionally. I mean, did you finish school and then start your music career? Yeah, or? well, no. So, that's interesting, too, because... So, I'd already been in, you know, met, met a guy in my class with a guitar. So, I always, you know, I was like, oh, here we go. This is how we do it. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why I was thinking, oh, it's a guitar just showed up. So, it's like, ah, oh, yes, I need to get one. So, yeah. anyway... So then he wasn't good, that wasn't going to work, me and him, he was younger, wanted to play Beatles songs, I'm like, ah, I'm going to cut it, I don't do that. So I started hanging out with the older boys, uh -huh. this is where the trouble starts, because of course, you know, I'm like maybe 15 or 16, and these guys are 17 or 18. Uh -huh. So I was in a band with um, one of the guys, older brothers, for a while, and these were like pot smoking, heavy drinking guys already, because... The singer was the old, even older brother. So I was like 16 and I was playing in bands with 18 and 20 year olds, uh -huh. which is a big jump when you're 16, 17. You're like, exactly. Whoa. So these guys were going to the pub and smoking pot and playing heavy metal. And I was like, just what you wanted. Yeah, I know. Yeah, just what I walked into. <laughs> but then I moved to another guy who was at my school called Mick James. Mm -hmm. he, was an, he was a bit older than me too. He'd already started to get a band together. And that band was called The Wigs. And that was probably my first proper band. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was probably 17. All right, and you were a bass player in that band? I was a bass player in that band, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And from from there, like, were the wigs? Um, did you get successful on the pub scene? Did you have kind of? Okay, so the the wigs were uh, the singer of that band didn't go to my school. He was another guy that we ran into, and he had friends that were in all these rockabilly bands. Mm -hmm. So we suddenly jumped to playing open for these rockabilly bands. A place called the Clarendon in mm -hmm. Hammersmith. We opened for the Stingrays, the Guana Bats. Um, uh, I think there's a bunch of rockabilly bands. The Medias were the biggest one at the time. It was like sort of rockabilly, psychabilly bands mm -hmm. and garage bands. It was the Mighty Caesars. We became later the head coach with Billy Childish. We played with those guys too. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yes, and I was only 17 yeah. and these guys were a little bit older and then the bass people were playing with us. So I already jumped in kind of deep, kind of, kind of quick. Yeah. But that didn't, but that, that band didn't really do much and it wasn't, it wasn't doing enough for me. And I think around that time, I was trying to find more. I was going to the clubs that all the bands were going to, which was mm -hmm. Dean Walls or um, Marquee, mm -hmm. hanging around where all the bands were playing. And at about that time, I must have seen a band called Hanoi Rocks. Yes, one and of that my was bands. yeah, I know. And that was a catalyst for a lot of bands in London and England. Was Hanoi Rocks? They came out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere. And hit the London scene. They'd, been, they'd made a few albums. They're living in Finland. They moved to London, and Razzle joined the band. Now, a, right. a little coincidence about Razzle was he lived in Muswell Hill, and he must have been a few years older than me. And at the time we were at school, we used to go see the Damned a lot. The yes. Damned played all the time. They played London just like every week it seems. Uh -huh. We go. See, me and my school friends would go see the Damned, and Razzle was always at the Damned shows. Really? So he kind of was like, oh, you know, kind of say hi because I knew him from my. He lived there. In Muswell Hill. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Hanoi Rocks was this catalyst for a lot of bands and They came to England. And in fact, if you watch all those wasted years, when Razzle gets up at the end and sing, sings uh, Blitzkrieg Bop. Uh-huh. I've seen my, that. Yeah. Well, I jump on the stage and throw my arm around him. That is so yeah. cool. So, yeah, 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 yeah. If you freeze frame it, you can, I can point me out. Because uh, I'm on that video. <laughs> I will definitely do that. Yeah, yeah. The, the fans I'm wearing a grey jacket that. and my hair's spiky but long. Anyway, it, <laughs> I jump on stage because I was like, oh, it's my mate. I'm getting up there. And so around that time, I think I joined a band then with a guy. and I met an American guy living in London. His name was Mick Cripps. Uh -huh. who later on went out to join LA Guns. But before LA Guns, he lived in London because his yes. parents are English. Uh -huh. So he comes over to England because there was this little scene happening of these kind of glammy bands mm -hmm. started off by Hanoi Rocks. So I joined a band with Mick Cripps and... Chris Bradshaw singing and my friend Adam Ross playing guitar. Mm -hmm. and we were called the Killer Elite. Played a few shows, not much happened. But it was a good band. We were playing the same kind of, going to the same clubs as all the bands. It was a, then there was the Dogs of the Moor and the Choir Boys. But the Choir Boys hadn't got going yet. Okay. But it was the same scene. Mm -hmm. So when that did, when the Killer Elite, Mick moved back to America and it kind of band imploded. And at the same time, he must have just left by a week. I ran into... Spike, the singer, and Guy Bailey from the Choir Boys at Dingwalls, uh -huh. and I said I played bass. And they said our bass player just quit. Do you want to do it? I was like, yes. And I could have only I don't know. I can't even think what year that would be. I'd like to say it was probably eighty five or eighty six. Now, did you know right away how talented they were? I mean, it was kind of funny for me watching interviews with Spike in particular because. He, it, like, I have no idea what he's like now, but back then he seemed like such a shy, quiet person. Yes. And then when he got on stage and sang, yeah, that voice he, comes out. Yeah, yeah know, it's yeah. like a lion's roar. <laughs> I remember uh, thinking, uh, first of all, rehearsing them a few times, thinking that a the songs were structured better than the stuff I've been doing with all the other bands. Well, oh, these songs yeah. actually sound like real songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then after a few rehearsals, I did realize that wow, this guy can really kind of sing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's singing these. So he was a great singer, and Guy Bailey and Spike had written the, uh, the bunk. Most, most of the songs that were on the first album, we were doing most of them bef way before we recorded the album. That was the yeah. kind of bulk of the set was misled, and 7 O'Clock Without the Chorus, mm -hmm. I hadn't done Hey You, uh, Long Time Coming, Maybe Came Later, um, uh, Take Me Home we were doing, Man on the Loose we were doing. What about Roses and Rings? Roses and Rings we were doing from very early on, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. probably my favorite one. Yeah, yeah, it's a great song. And that that was one of those songs, like, wow, these are really good songs, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a lot of bands are just kind of thrashing it out, mm -hmm. almost heavy metal sounding with not much song, and people who couldn't sing. So we were playing these <laughs> great songs with Spike singing great, 
and that was like I was like now a few rehearsals in I was like wow this is really good mm -hmm. but having said that it still took quite a while for us to luckily we had a friend called Adrian Purser he was a, a booker at the universities uh, I don't know what, what university he was at but they had these things called rock societies. It was like a university like, thing. They had the Friday night would be the rock society, and everyone would go and have a drink, get drunk, and listen to music. That they, sounds they, so British, the rock. Yeah, society. The ro I know it was. <laughs> I love well, it. that and it's short to the rock sock, which was even worse. <laughs> the rock, it sounds like you got like a dirty sock. But anyway, so this guy Adrian, we were playing around London, but he could because he was in, in on this scene of the universities, and they were like had their own rock societies. Mm -hmm. We started playing the universities, so yeah. we got we got out of London. And out into the rest of England and got pretty early on. A lot of those, yeah, a lot of the other bands who were up here were like Dogs to Moor, maybe, and um, the Gunslingers were around, and it was the London Cowboys. Mm -hmm. Those bands, some of them, I think we got out of London a bit more than they did. Okay. So that's where we got a bit of a following, and we did that probably 86, 87, for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, we went to the Buckley Tivoli, you know, Sheffield University. Um, Wolverhampton University, I think Wolverhampton. Oh, yeah. There was a bunch of places we kept going back to. Yeah. So people were like, and, then, and people were into, you know, the Dogs to Moor. Dogs to Moor were probably the other band that was uh, similar to us. Okay. Yeah. At the time. You know, Nirvana actually got successful in a similar way. Like their their main audience was college students yeah. to begin with. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was a great. I don't know if it still goes on in England. I think it probably does, but uh, it's probably slightly different. But that's how. So I, that, I think that's how we got like a bit of a following. And got out of London rather than just be insular and like a lot of bands were just playing around London and wouldn't yeah. go anywhere. Like, why should we go anywhere else? But we actually got out of there because of this guy Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. He's still around. I don't know what he does now, but okay. Thank you, Adrian. We're Thanks, all grateful. Adrian, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, cool. So um one thing I noticed was how many people you toured with before you recorded, like you were with the Cherry Bombs, and I've interviewed their singer Anita Chelema, who's yep. a wonderful lady. Yes. Hi Anita. Hi Anita. And um, what was that like? Well, yeah, because uh, yeah, because we'd got out of London and been on that stuff. So, see, again, they would probably play at a lot of the same places. I guess our name had been around as like, oh, they'd be great to open up because we yeah. were, had already been out of London, so we were newer. So when these people went on tour, they're like, oh, bring those guys with you because they've been here already. Uh -huh. That kind of thing. And I think that's the Cherry Bombs were a little later. I think earlier on we did things with a band called Wolf Spain, mm -hmm. but then we played at the Mark. Our friend Bush Telfer, hi Bush, <laughs> he was a big fan of ours very early on and we played at the marquee and we have everybody that ever played at the marquee I mean like things like White Lion and things like I don't, I don't remember who else um, it was a whole run when we did the marquee open for people nice and babysitters were our good friends too we opened for them and then Bush took a chance on us and made it let's headline the marquee uh -huh. and that worked out really good I think it was like a Christmas New Year's Eve or something I, well, I don't know what it was it was one night we headlined the marquee and we got enough people in there and that became a regular too. We were headlining the marquee, which is quite a, a bit of a jump from a lot of the other bands. We stepped up a little level by yeah. doing that. And then Bush became a little bit of a manager of ours at the beginning too. So he helped us out as well. So there's, you know, there's certain people along the way that do like, a, oh, had seen something in us to go, oh yeah, let's put them in these shows out of town. Oh yeah, let's get them on the marquee headlining. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, also my uncle Phil somewhere, jumped in somewhere along the line and, he said, well, you, you, he was kind of pseudo-managing us for a minute as well. And mm -hmm. uh, he got us, he said, we need a photo. So he got Ross Halfin, the famous rock photographer, to do a photo shoot. And I, our first photo shoot was with Ross Halfin. So we had little help-ups all the way, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But the Cherry Bombs was a little bit later. I, I, I don't know what year that was. It, felt, it feels like it was probably 88 or something, 87, 88, I don't know. Because along the way... Another story, sorry to interrupt you. Cause it's okay. It's totally okay. It's, this is, <laughs> Along this is the way, uh, which would have been, you know, we're in 86, 87, Ginger, this guy Ginger joined the band. Mm -hmm. And he was in the band probably cut for a few years, 87, 88, and we got signed in 89. So he was right in the band until we got signed. And of course, as you know, Ginger didn't record the first album with us. He was... He kind of left. He was wanting to do his own thing, which became the Wild Hearts. But uh -huh. he was in the Choir Boys before he did that, and did a lot of those shows. Oh, Burkhead Stairways was another place we used to play. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that gig because Ginger decided that he thought it was a great idea to get really drunk and and smash his amps up, and he fell over, and the amps fell over, and it was a whole big thing. 
My goodness. Funny things that stick in your mind. I remember Burton Hill Stairways, Ginger falling over the amp, and the amp just collapsed on the floor, and you know, that was the end of the gig. <laughs> Well, you know, one, one thing I was going to ask about was um, opening for Guns N' Roses at the Hammersmith Odeon. Yes. Yeah. Was yeah. that in, um, I, that probably okay. would have been... So we, I think what happened then is by this point, just to get the story straight. Okay. By this point, we what we did was I think somewhere earlier, a bit earlier before Guns N' Roses, we'd signed a little record deal with this label called Survival and we did two singles for them, which mm-hmm. did good, pretty good. And then we got picked up by EMI. Right. And so... We, EMI. Oh, yeah, no, hold on a second. We've done these two singles of survival. Yeah, somewhere along the line, someone had told Guns N' Roses about us or they'd heard of something we'd been doing and they asked for us to be on that show because nice. that show at Hampstead Odeon was... Uh... No, I'll tell you what it was. I'll take that all back. Guns N' Roses came to England. I can't remember what year. I'd have to look it up. I know that they played the marquee at least once. Well, they did two nights in a row at the marquee. Okay. All right, and this is what happened. Okay, I remember what happened now. Okay. I got it. I got it straight. It took okay. a minute. So we played on the Friday night, mm-hmm. and Guns N' Roses played the Saturday and the Sunday. So nice. when we played the Friday night, as I said earlier, our friend got us headlining, and it was a, it was a big weekend. Mm-hmm. Everyone in England heard about Guns N' Roses, but hadn't seen them, so it was quite a lot of anticipation. Yeah. So we played Friday night, and they came to the marquee to check out the venue and see who was playing, and we were playing. Nice. That's how that happened. And then we went to see them Saturday and Sunday. What'd you think? Oh my God. Well, when they, when they, everyone in England was doing the same kind of similar thing to us, like this kind of rock and roll faces, Hanoi Rocks, Stones kind of thing. Uh-huh. But when Guns N' Roses came to play in England, it was a look much heavier and much harder and had a different attitude from London people in England, just lyrically and musically. Yeah. So they came on stage, played Welcome to the Jungle, finished the song, and you could have heard a pin drop, because everyone went, what the fuck was that? <laughs> you know, people were like, what was that? Oh my God. Like, not sure if it was brilliant or stupid. They were like, what was that? Because yeah. it was pretty outrageous. You know, we were like, wow. But of course it was brilliant. It was yeah. like, we took a minute for everyone to catch on and go, wow, what was that? Because it was like punk rock and heavy metal. Which is a bit like what Hannah we do, punk and heavy, you know, punk and heavy metal mixed together, yeah. and that's kind of Guns N' Roses took it a little bit further uh-huh. than Hannah did. Hannah could still be a bit like just rock and roll, but this was like another thing. This was yeah. like hardcore punk and hardcore heavy metal mixed together. Yeah, for me, like great I, songs. Exactly, like for me, what what I think the difference is um, is how much more aggressive they are. I can see yeah. the Hanoi Rocks influence, but there's much more aggression. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, that's why I said when they finished playing "Welcome to the Jungle," even the song "Welcome to the Jungle" in the lyrics, you're like, "What was that?" Yes. <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. Uh, so they just stepped it up. They put the bar way high. Anyway, so they saw us. So anyway, they came back. That was in June. They came back in October. And I think uh-huh. it, I think it was '87. And is that where the picture of you with Izzy Stradlin and Guy Bailey was taken? Backstage at the Hammersmith? Okay, cool. Yeah, I've Probably. got a lot of I've got a lot of Izzy and Guns N' Roses fans, so that's kind of why uh, okay. I yes. bring it up. But. So anyway, yeah, so Guns N' Roses, so they saw us at the marquee in June, and they came back in October and said, um, oh, let's have that band over for us. Okay. It was actually, uh, to tell you the truth, it was actually Guns N' Roses headline and Faster Push Get were on the whole tour, and uh-huh. they just added us on for the London show, because they liked us so much. Nice. Thanks, guys. <laughs> And um, well, that, actually, I kind of, I kind of wanted to ask about what kind of style you had in mind for the Choir Boys. Like, what, what were your, uh, what were your main ambitions for the band's sound? And was there any, just uh, again, like, what did you have in mind for it? You'd seen Guns N' Roses, you'd seen Hanoi Rocks. You, there was this scene you were part of. Like, how did you guys want to set yourselves apart? Well, uh, yeah, well, so the main songwriter in the Choir Boys back in the early days was uh, Guy Bailey. He's uh-huh. no longer in the band, and see him now and again he was actually in the pack and cowboys we'll get to that later but okay. he was a big faces fan so yes. i think they were leaning more of that and, and the way spike's voice sounds which is very well stuart-esque kind of but not really people say it's a little stuart. it doesn't sound like it sounds like a lot of classic frankie miller or uh, the guy from nazareth or even bon scott is what it sounds like yeah I, yeah I he's got that, that yeah. which is a very northern English voice, even Brian Johnson's voice, maybe as well. But anyway, um, so Guy was a more classic rock person, Guy Bailey. So I think he was tending to be more like 
classic rock, which was good because that's what gave it such great songs, rather than just riffing away and being really heavy metal. Yeah. Which he hated. He hated any heavy metal, you know. Yeah. Maybe the, you, yeah, go on. And you guys kind of came of age when hair metal was in full. Yeah, we got well, like so we got like so. thrown in with that. We were never trying to do that. That just happened, and that was what everyone looked like at the time. You kind of toe the line a bit sometimes with that kind of thing, but um, we never tried. Guy Bailey would always say, "Oh, well, it sounds too heavy metal. Don't do that." You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we just sort of shy away from that. That's why I think the songs stuck out a bit more on that first album, Good. and maybe most of the second album. But anyway, so we, uh, but then later on, uh, again, when we did our second album, we did Guns, for Guns N' Roses again on the Use Your Illusion tour, which would have been 90 or 91 or whenever. We did a, like, a bunch of European shows. With them. But we also opened for Aerosmith, and we went for White Snake, and we opened for, oh, I, the list goes on, I can't remember, the but Johnny, Thund, uh, Johnny Thunders we opened for. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. You know, one of your fans online actually wanted me to ask you about the White Snake tour. Is there some kind of band legend around that? Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's okay. funny. I don't know how, who would remember that, but uh, we were doing this White Snake tour, and we were going down really. We've been had, had some success. People knew who we were. We were going down quite well. And this is much later. This is like when we got back to. I think it's what year it was. I think it's when we got back together again in the two thousand early two thousands. It's a whole other story. That goes anyway, so whenever the White Snake goes, but the gist of the story is uh, White Snake, David Carvedell, lovely people, mm-hmm. nothing wrong with them. Management were a bit protective that you weren't allowed to go to certain places backstage, you weren't allowed to smoke backstage or really drink in the hallways just to protect their, their thing, you know. Okay. I mean, that's fine. But one of the things that happened was we gave, on the first date, we gave our merch that they their merch guy had to sell ours. Okay. Which is always a problem. We weren't allowed to have a merch person. And there was a rule you can only have one t shirt and one C D for sale. Well, we had like multiple t shirts, multiple CDs. Spike wanted to sell his solo C D and the merch man said, No, you can't do that. Just those rules. And that's okay, that's fine, there's rules. If you get to headline, you get to make the rules. That's yeah. the way it goes. So the merch guy put Spike's CDs in his merch flight case. Mm-hmm. And so every day after that first show, we were, Spike was saying, can I get my CDs back? Because he could go outside and sell them after the show, or he could have them, give them to people. Yeah. And Merch guy said, I'm too busy, I'll get it later. Uh-huh. So this went on and on and on for about a week, and then Spike said, was drunk one night, he said, I want my CDs back right now. Uh-huh. And then Merch guy said, I'm too busy, I'm loading the gear back in the truck, I can't, yeah, I can't get the CDs back. But he said, Spike grabbed a mic stand and, and, and went up to the flight case and was hitting it with a, a thing that I want my CDs now. Oh the guy said, okay, okay, okay. The guy put the key in the lock and was so flustered because Spike was drunk and hitting him, threatening him with a mic stand. He broke the key off in the flight case lock and said, now nah, look what you made me do. I can't open my, you've effed it up. I can't even open my flight case. Spike said, I open the flight case. And he gets that st- thing that's whacking the flight case and trying to pry it open. We finally do bend the lock back and get the thing open. Spike grabs his CDs. We go, anyway, this is all happening outside the backstage area where the trucks are all parked and, you know, the, the, dry, you know, the loading dock. And I could see this window with a curtain and I saw the window go as we're all fighting and arguing and then the curtain shut again like that and I was like, yeah. that doesn't look very good. Two yeah. seconds later, the, our tour manager, Bruce, picked, gets a phone call and says, yes, 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 okay, yes, okay, yes, yes, okay, okay, oh, okay, oh yeah, yes. Puts the phone down and says, all right, lads, we're going home. <laughs> that was the end of the tour. Oh, Someone was watching us at the window going, these guys are too much trouble. Get them out of here. So we got fired. That's why. It was all over Spike's CDs that were in the merch man's flight case. Nothing to do with how we were playing, being too outrageous backstage, going down better than the headliner. It's just that we were causing trouble with the crew. Okay. So there you go. That's the story. All right. Well, one thing that I want to touch on is um, when your album was recorded. Like, did you did you think that you were making a did you feel like you were making something classic that was going to stand the test of time? I mean, recently, Classic Rock Magazine ranked. Um, a bit of what you fancy, I think number fifty-seven on really? the best albums of the nineties. Oh, that's great! Yeah, I right. didn't know that. Well, wow, yeah, congratulations! <laughs> yeah, oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty good. We've always had a good, um, known people at Classic Rock and know those guys who work there. So uh, I knew it was kind of spe- we. The funny thing is, we came to LA. We got signed in eighty-nine, and we came to LA. 
and we rehearsed at the alley. Yes. First place I ever went. Went to the Rainbow the first night we were ever in town. Did you see Lemmy? <laughs> I don't think he was living here by that point. Okay. No, he wasn't living here in 89. He came in the late 90s to live in LA. Okay. But, um, yeah, we came to LA, made the record, and we used a guy called Jim Cregan, who used to be in Cockney Rebel and in the Rod Stewart band, produced it. Mm-hmm. And we rehearsed at the alley, recorded at Cherokee Studios on Fairfax Avenue, and we were in LA for probably three or four months doing that. Uh-huh. And at that time, we were like, this is great, we love, I love it here. That's hence why I never end up going home, <laughs> really. Uh-huh. But uh, I, yeah, we thought, we, were, we thought it sounded good. good. We knew we were onto something. And what did you think of recording? I mean, is, did you need to do any modifications to, from being a live player to a studio? Yeah, well, not me personally, but I tell you one thing we did do, it's first of all, in the rehearsals at the alley with Jim Cregan, we changed some of the... When we sat down and did what we did live, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, Jim and we agreed that some of, could be, some of the songs could be better. In fact, 7 o'clock never had the chorus in it. We played those two parts without a port. You know, we had 7 o'clock time with the mic. That was never in there. So, yeah. so that was kind of like, because we never could think of what to do there. So we had a bit of encouragement from the gym and some other people. Seven o'clock became more formed. Hey You was, again, didn't have the chorus like it is now. It was kind of a mishmash of what it is. We had the down, 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 down. That part was all going on, but then this whole chorus part needed figuring out, so that got worked on. Whipping Boy was written in the rehearsal for the... They were, we were talking, okay, all well, the songs sound great, but there's space to do something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. That's where Whipping Boy came from. Nice. Um, and then I think we did a lot of work. Chris Johnson, who played the piano and the keyboards, he was not... had only been doing that... we have been doing it quite a few years, but the Hammond parts was quite new to him, so we had a little help with the ham and stuff, and to figure out what to play. Uh-huh. Um, and then the biggest one was that when we were rehearsing with our drummer, he wasn't quite cutting it. So what Jim Cregan said to us is, why don't we send him, to tell him not to come in tomorrow, and I'll have one of my friends come play drums, and you tell me if you notice the difference. We're like, well, he's a great drummer, what are you talking about? His name is Cozy. Mm-hmm. We're like, no, he's Cozy, he's great. They brought this guy called Ian Wallace down, who was in, in, played with um, a bunch of people. He played with Bob Dylan yeah. amongst people. He was an English guy. He came down, and he was like one of those really professional, seasoned session drummers. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, I, we said, do you want to learn the song? He goes, no, just start playing it. I'll just play. And we're like, oh, okay. I've never heard that before. Usually he wants to figure it out. So we played the song, 7 o'clock, and he just came in and played the song. And we did notice. It was like, wow. It sounds so different. And it was just because the drum, we had our English guy who was a good drummer for us at the time, but we'd obviously outgrown him and he hadn't, kept, kept, he hadn't caught up with us. Yeah. And then I brought this guy down who was a professional season session guy and he just didn't want to learn the song. He said, just play it. And we went, well, right, the intro, and he just came right in where he was meant to. <laughs> like, we're like, how do you know how to do that? And then he just played the song way better. So that was the biggest change, I think, having that guy. If we'd have done it with our drama, it would have been okay, not great. Doing it with this guy, Ian Wallace, really made the difference. Because, you know, if you've got a great drum track, you can pretty much do anything over the top. It'll sound good. If you've got a bad drum track, even the best song won't sound that great. Okay. One thing I'm curious about is how many instruments you play. I mean, of course, you play bass, but... No, I just play bass. I used to play... I started off playing guitar, but I wasn't very good. So that's how you get... That's how bass players are formed. <laughs> They're not very good guitar players, so they get caught on bass. But then I fell in love with playing the bass. But that's it. That's what I really do, play the bass. And si- now I sing in the Brutalists, so, mm-hmm. which is something I never planned on doing, singing. It just came up because no one else would do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it works out. Yeah. So, and um, so, okay, uh, a bit of what you fancy was released. What was the initial reaction like from your observation? Oh, yeah, we just went through the roof. We went, we, we, you know, we remember we, uh, it came out and then we had a tour booked. We had a single come out, and then we had a tour booked, and then before the album came out, and immediately after that single came out, because it was on a real record label, there was some radio play, mm-hmm. it actually charted, yeah. and the shows were just like, we, we had to go to bigger venues, because it was like suddenly, boom, it was, that was it, it just took off overnight. Nice, and you guys were on top of the pops, Yeah, we were on top of it a couple of times, yeah, Hey You was the second single, and that went to number 14. The album went to number two yeah. in the album chart, so it was a pretty big time. 
at the time where it was kind of a bit of a whirlwind, you know, but, um, we toured the album for a good 18 months. We did a lot of work on that. Yeah. Touring wise, went to Japan, Canada, all over Europe, open for people, headlined. We did the whole thing. Yeah, and I noticed that, um, I mean, it came out in 1990, and you guys were kind of sandwiched in between the final days of hair yeah, metal, metal versus the Seattle scene. Intro. Like, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, yeah. But, well, actually, we were cl- no, we were free and clear at the first album because it was 1990. And in fact, our album came out March 1990. So did the Black Crows came out the same month, same year. That's right. It's funny because earlier on, when I was telling you we did these singles for a little indie label mm-hmm. before we joined, signed to EMI, Rick Rubin was calling us because uh-huh. he wanted to sign us. He yeah. couldn't get us, so he took the Black Crows instead. Yeah, <laughs> I remember him calling us, and we're going, "Who is this guy? Just like rap bands or something?" And then, what's he going to do with us? I don't know. We were just. We, we kind of blew it off, which may be a mistake looking back, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Yeah. But um, anyway, so when you, uh, like, but when you had that success, did you feel like a good buzz around you? Like maybe this could, I mean, one band that you were compared to a lot in the beginning was the Rolling Stones. I yeah. Mean, did, did you see your career having the kind of longevity? I don't think, I think when you're at that age, you don't think about it. Okay. I don't know how old I was in 1990. I guess I was... I was 25 mm-hmm. in 1990. I guess that's still kind of young. And I don't think you really, you think it go on, I, you automatically think it go on forever. Yeah. Which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But you learn, you, that's a thing you learn along the way. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, obviously we did a second album after the first one. And I think the problem with the second one was that came out, which I don't know what year that was, 92 or something? Yeah, 92 or 93. Yeah, something like that. Yeah quite a big gap from the first one. Mm-hmm. The touring was still pretty good, but I think we did suffer from the, like a lot of bands from the Nirvana situation. Yeah. And I've heard other people say it too. Oh my God, it was all going great till Nirvana came along. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of, a lot of the hair metal bands will say that. And uh, it affected us too as well, because there was suddenly, you know, it'd been, we'd been doing it for, by that point, eight years anyway. Yeah. So, you know, we had a good, and that was before we were signed and then signed. So, you know, f- things change. And yeah. So we weren't so suddenly, and it, we did actually get dropped after that second album. And we, of course, I did, in, in meanwhile, all, in all of that, Sharon Osbourne was our manager as well. That's right. And yeah. so when this Nirvana thing happened, it's like, it sounds like it's like the plague or something. <laughs> but it that kind of did wipe away a lot of bands. And I think we got wiped away with it as well, I would say probably. That's yeah. what he had say to do it because Sharon suddenly didn't want, didn't manage us anymore. Our record label let us go, and all these different things happened that we couldn't survive. Yeah, uh, we weren't strong enough to survive, and we were like 26, 27, 28, 29. We're still kind of young, and it was like we thought, oh, we're just getting on a record deal. Well, actually, we didn't even think that. I think we the second tour was kind of grueling, mm-hmm. and I think after that, we everyone needed a break, so we kind of took a break, but that became the end of the band. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I've I've read that one thing that was a bit of a barrier barrier for you near to the beginning was being called the Queer Boys. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. We were called the Queer Boys. Yeah. I thought it was a great name at the time, and I think we could probably get away with it today. But back then, I tell you what it was. Going back to those Rock Society shows, there was also you know, there'd also be hand in hand with the Rock Society would be the Gay and Lesbian Society, okay. and they were having none of it. So oh. they they said we couldn't play one of the universities we had with that name. It was derogatory. So that was the first inclination that was probably not a good idea. And also, my good friend Lemmy at the time said, you'll never get anywhere with a name like that. You've got to change it. And I was like, no, it's going to be fine, Lemmy. And of course, he was right. Okay. It was just a bit too close to the bone, I think. I mean, it's a great name. I mean, I think it'd be a better name for a punk band rather than what we were doing. But it was a funny name. I liked it. The Queer Boys. Okay. Well... When, uh, one thing that I'm curious about is, um, do you have a preference as far as the early records? Like, do you like the first or the second better than the other? I like the first one. It's just what we would just like. That's, it's always with a lot of bands. That was four years of life into one record, whereas the second one was just kind of had to get it together after the fact, you know what I mean? So I like, it's like that for a lot of bands. Okay. First or second, first album is always the one that's like taking years to manipulate and get together and... Thing, you know, you can play it live and see what works and what doesn't. And the second album was had to be done in the studio, 
hurry up, get it out. You know, and that's a common story amongst bands. The second ones are tough. Yeah, and there's probably not the kind of wonder that you had during the. No, no, the way, yeah, you kind of got a bit. Very quickly, you can get jaded by the whole thing, yeah. and that goes for anybody. I mean, you go, oh, got that record now. You know, it becomes a job sometimes for some people. Okay. Not they did for us, but it did. It we did grind on a bit. I mean, there was delays for us doing the second album, which didn't help. Okay. It gave us a six month break that we could have never had, should have never had. Okay. Well, like uh, I'm kind of curious why why the six month break didn't turn into a productive time. Like did did because we were young and we were stupid and we were riding around. I was here and most of us were here in LA and we were just. Young and stupid. Okay. Well, one thing. <laughs> oh, All you I mean, kids it, out there, don't waste your time. Okay. Well, I'd rather have you be honest than say yeah. something else. No, we were young. We were like, oh, we'll just wait. We, oh, it's going to be, we'll do another album. It's going to be the same as the first one. You know, we'd probably waste six months just like, we were waiting around for the studio to be available and the producer to be available. And it went from a one month to six months very quickly because we had, it got backed up. Really, we should have jumped to use someone else, but we didn't. They wanted to stick to the plan, and it got pushed and pushed and pushed. It was like a, it might have even been ninth. It was a long time we waited to do the second album. That really didn't help us. Okay, well, um, going back, I wanted to ask you about a couple of people you encountered back then. Um, yes. Like I know that another person on the London scene for a while was Courtney Love. I was in a movie with her, although not in the same town. I was in that movie called Sid and Nancy. You were. Yes. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. The that band so cool. I was in, with, the band I was in with Mick Cripps was called the Killer Elite, and Mick had left the band. We had someone else come in and play guitar, and they hired us to be, to be um, what was meant to be Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. So there's a scene where the the Sex Pistols are in a pub throwing darts at us. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was. Up. And then Courtney oh, yeah. Love was in the movie too, but she was in the New York section of the movie. But I never met her back then. I know she lived over there and stuff, but I never knew her. Okay. Well. But, you know, you actually wound up touring with Soundgarden as well. Did we? Yeah. No, we did one show with them. One show with them. I remember what it was. It was um, Gathering of the Tribes, it was called. And I think it was a thing put together by Ian Asprey from The Cult, which kind of turned into Lollapalooza later. It was the first incarnation of it. It was like they wanted to do a, a traveling show of bands from different genres playing together so hmm. I, th I can't remember who else was on it there was like a real mixed mixed bag but we were on that there was two shows I can't remember where the two shows were. I think it got a feeling it was LA and San Francisco mm -hmm. I can't remember what year and I can't remember much about it but yeah they were on the they were on the show okay. I can't remember where I even saw them all right well, <laughs> that's okay yeah um so after um after the second record was released though how long were you guys on tour but yeah, usual thing, 18 months or something, you know, probably a year. Okay. Yeah, so that took us to like 94 or something. All right. And, and I remember when, we, I remember getting off the, I remember the last time the bus pulled into London, everyone was like, the tour was finally done, you know, there'd been like stops and starts and it was finally over and getting off that bus was the last time we ever played together as that band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it was like, and I kind of remember it going, oh, yeah, I felt that it was that there was like, oh, this is probably not going to happen. Like with this lineup anymore after this bus ride, it's mm -hmm. kind of funny. I kind of knew. Okay, like so, how did you how did you deal with the end of that though? I mean, and uh, another thing that I wanted to ask about though was during that tour, and seeing your second record come out and not have the commercial success that the first one did, did that kind of contribute to? You guys eventually parting ways. Yeah, it probably has anything to do with it. I should think. I'm sure if it was going great, it, we, we, got, we probably would have toured longer. Mm -hmm. It probably has it. It was the whole thing of Sharon wasn't managers anymore. We knew our record label wasn't picking up the option for a third album. Yeah. The tour had been grueling, and in some places not as good as the first tour. Mm -hmm. And Nirvana had come along, so it was <laughs> all those combinations of things and personality clashes with some of the people in the band mm -hmm. had all added. Yeah, so it, walking off that bus that last time, it was like you kind of knew that was it for that section of that. Okay. But it wasn't the end because eventually, as we know, in 2000, we got back together again here in LA and made another record, This Is Rock and Roll, and then we actually did another one called Well Oiled mm -hmm. with the same line, with similar line up, lineup, some different people in it, but uh, similar. Okay. And so what did you do between... Um 
leaving the band and then right so I, was, so I came back to LA in 94 whatever and very quickly uh, me and Guy Griffin mm-hmm. who'd taken over from Ginger yep. had a little band I think it was called Blood From A Stone for a minute with Jason Nesmith on guitar uh, we didn't do many shows we just rehearsed and we did, did some demos and Jason Nesmith had a friend called Donovan Leach and he was putting this band together called Nancy Boy Jason told me about it I went down to meet Donovan and they were already recording some demos in the studio mm-hmm. and it was so night and day from what I'd been doing which was this kind of rock and roll band all serious and like mm-hmm. hard partying Donovan was this like flamboyant magnetic character that wanted to do this crazy new wave band that was cu- doing a cover of Our Friends Electric by Gary Newman uh-huh. he had ideas about what we were going to wear on stage and how the stage I was like what is this guy on about this guy's crazy. And he goes, we're going to go to England because there's a big scene starting there with bands like Suede uh-huh. and stuff like that. And like a new, he went to like a new romantic band. Where he, was all, and he, was a, he was a model in the fashion world. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this guy's out of his mind, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so different from what I'd been doing. It was like night and day. Yeah. And to his credit, he was actually spot on. There was a, a, a scene in England happening called, the, it was called Romo at the time. I don't know what the name Saint do New Romantics Movement or something. It was bad. It was bad. It was a band called. Um, oh, there was a couple of bands. I can't remember their names now. It's kind of all getting. It. But he was onto something. So we played, went to England and played some shows, and people loved it. And then we came back to LA, and he decided we're going to go live in New York. <laughs> and I was like, well, what have I got to lose? I mean, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. So we went yeah. to live in New York. Donovan was a fashion model for a time and an actor. So I went to live in New York and this whole new world stuff, a whole new life started in New York. We actually used to live there for five years. Mm-hmm. The second day I was there, I was in a photo shoot and I was one of the models for a CK1 commercial <laughs> with Kate Moss and Quentin Crisp and a bunch of other famous models. So I had a, uh, suddenly had a late modeling career. <laughs> I was in a couple of other photo shoots too. So then I ended up starting working for... Um, fashion photographers and building sets for um, fashion photo shoots mm. and this whole so uh, so we was doing this Nazi boy thing in New York hanging out with all the models and photographers and I worked for a production designer and this whole, so this whole New York life happened okay. and it had nothing to do with the client voice whatsoever okay and I'm kind of curious like did you do that because you enjoyed it or because you wanted an income on top of what you were doing in the in the band? Well, I need obviously, you know, the band Nancy Boy wasn't earning any money, so uh, it was, you know, we were trying to. We did actually did two, two records. We actually got signed to Sire Records mm-hmm. while we were in New York and did a record for them. And we did a couple of indie records for an English label. We went to England a bunch of times and played from New York. We played fashion shows. It was just so night and day from the choir boys. I, yeah. And then just, I like photography too, so working for photographers was fantastic. I loved it. I was like, oh, this is great. That's how I got into that world. But then, of course, that came to an end, too. You know, after a while, Donovan maybe lost interest in it. After like four, This is 95 to 2000. It was five years. Okay. Maybe Donovan lost interest in it, and it kind of faded out. And that's when I got a phone call. Do I want to do this Choir Boys record back in L.A. again? I was in New York. I was like, damn it. Okay, packed the bags, went back to L.A. <laughs> from New York, and did those two Choir Boys records. So I was in the Choir Boys again from 2000 to 2005. Okay. Two albums. I was living in L.A., the band had all gravitated back to England because that's where the audience was. Mm-hmm. And so the only re- the reason why I quit doing that in 2005 was I was here and they were there. And I said, I had a kid. I was doing the work as a production designer. I too had a job. So every time I'd have to go to England for four weeks, I wouldn't earn any money. <laughs> come back with very little money. Mm-hmm. It was great to play with the guys, but then I had to come back and yeah, pay, pay I, bills I, and pay rent and stuff. So it was getting different. I did it for five years, mm-hmm. multiple tours. The first tour was Alice Cooper... Thunder, Choir Boys, Dogs to Moor. That was nice. in 2000. That was the first. So we put that record out and jumped on that tour. It was fantastic. And, and then we started doing our own, own tours too again, and it was all good. But I just couldn't sustain the LA to London. Yeah. One year I did it four times. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh that flight again. And to go there and then come back with no money. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. It's, you know, it was like, if I'd have lived in England, it would, I probably would still be in the band. Okay, like, have you ever considered moving back to England full time, or are you pretty well, much based in LA? Now that I've been here so long, uh, I have a sixteen-year-old daughter. That's right. <laughs> Hi, Charlie, <laughs> and who lives here, and also I work here doing 
production stuff. I don't know what I would do in England anymore. I mean, I have lots of friends there. I'm sure I could figure something out, but I, I have, I'm here. So it's, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, this this is just sort of my nerdiness coming out. But yes. even though Nirvana kind of caused a movement that ended a lot of people, ended or altered a lot of people's careers, did you like any of the Seattle sound? Not really, no. Okay, why not? No, um... I mean, obviously, the Nirvana had some good songs, so you can't help but go, oh, that's pretty cool, you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't really my thing. I, I, to me, it sounded like some bad punk bands from England <laughs> that didn't make it. Because they do, I mean, they to say the truth, you know, Nirvana ripped off a lot of stuff. I mean, the obvious one is uh, 80s by Killing Joke. Okay. Which is a song that um, I think Team Spirit is ripped off from. Down, now, 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 that's... Killing Joke song and I think they actually did have to pay Killing Joke after a while because it was oh. actually plagiarism you know, it's exactly the same oh. and I think another couple of songs sound very close to some of the British punk bands I'm not sure some stuff sounds very close like either the Buzzcocks or uh, it's a couple of things it sounds like so they definitely had their influences which is great you know mm-hmm. and we did too we were sound like the faces they sound like Sound like he- slightly heavier, dirtier British punk bands is what they sound like. Nirvana. And that was not my thing at the time. Okay. Although, I'm, although maybe I'm closer to it now, liking stuff like that, than I was back then. Okay. Uh, in fact, back then they were the enemy. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, there was always, which is, you know, not that we, we dress great, we just ridiculous at the time, but uh, there was something about Kurt Cobain wearing a green cardigan that just didn't, didn't do him for me, you know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or a green jumper with holes in it. I'm like, ah, eh, get out of here. Yeah, you but, know. Uh, but looking back, uh, but, they, but it's obviously a great band that's influenced a lot of people and, and songs still sound great, so I was probably a little bitter at the time. Okay, well, Michael Monroe was actually kind of cute when he talked about Nirvana. Like, he said, you know, I like the music, but God, I hated the clothes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I was like, you know, what's all that about? Um, Artie, so tell me about what it was like um, becoming a father. Like you oh, became. Geez. Well, that was that happened while I was doing the um, choir boys stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm going backwards and forwards to England, and so that's one of the reasons why I stopped doing it. Was because you know, obviously, you got to have regular income, and I was breaking my regular income up to go to England all the time with the choir boys. That's kind of why that had to stop, and I had to get a proper. No, I didn't get a proper job. Phew, I'd never do that. <laughs> but I worked in production, and I still do. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of why that happened. Okay. I mean, you're either, you know, nowadays, you're either in a huge band where you have the luxury to do that full-time because that pays you, or you're in a, a band where you have to have a day job. There's no in-between anymore. You know? yeah. So I'd slip back from being in a band that paid me enough money not to have another job to being in a band where I had to have a job as well. Okay. And that's a lot of people do the same. I mean, everyone I know, you know, you know, I don't know. All the big bands now that have the luxury of just doing that are kind of older bands. Yeah. You know, like your White Snakes and your Colt, the Colt, you know, the, or whoever's been big and can still be big. Yeah, Foo Fighters. I don't really, yeah, Foo Fighters, yeah. I don't know. Who are the, now here's the question, who are the young rock bands? The only one I've ever seen that's any good is, uh, uh, Rival Sons, I like that band. Someone took me to see it, and I was like, oh, wow, this band's great. Okay. I like, like that band. I also like, um, what's that other band? Someone told me, played me some stuff by that band. Um, Dirty Honey, you heard of that band? I haven't. I'll, I'll have to check it someone out. Showed, someone told me about that band, I was like, ooh. And then there was an article about, like, Rock's Back, and it just quoted Dirty Honey. It was like, no. Nah. Like, someone showed me a couple of videos of that. It's pretty good. Cool. You know, Check them out. Yeah, a local band that I like around here is The Claws. Oh, those guys. I've played with those guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those guys are good. Who else do I like? I really like that band Starcrawler. Have you heard of them? I've heard of them. I cannot name a song. By no, them. I don't know many of their songs, but I've seen a couple of their videos. It's pretty cool. They're pretty good. Who else do I like? Damn it, I can't think right now. You know one band I do did like, and this is completely out. It was completely a different... I don't know when, what year it was. It was Supergrass was one of my favorite bands. Okay. Remember that band Supergrass from England? They were part yes, of that Britpop movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I recognized the name, but I couldn't name great it. Great band. Song. Yeah, great band. First album's excellent. excellent. I also like Suede. Suede's first album was really good as well. That was another favorite of mine. Awesome. Which was out of step of what I was doing. But I, I do like other stuff, you know. You know I would, but if I'm doing one thing, I can see 
like we were doing the choir boys and Sway came out. I was like, ooh, things are changing. Uh, even that, that was the English version of grunge was not the Sway are a grunge band. They were like a, I know they were one of the first before Britpop, before Blur and Oasis, there was Suede, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what the movement was called, it probably had a name in England, <laughs> and it does. There was another great band called These Animal Men were really good as well. Anyway, sorry, I okay. diverge. Oh, it's totally fine. I, I love it when people diverge. Yeah. You, know? you always learn something new. Alrighty, cool. So, um, your daughter was born, and that was kind of, you know, when you were in the grind of going back and forth from England. Yeah. Um, describe when you made the decision to to not be with the choir boys anymore. We just done. I, I it was just we'd done another tour. I'd flown over to England. That tour was over, and I was just going back to LA. I was like, Ugh. you know, sometimes in a band, and this happens to a lot of people. You like, you know, choir boys love the band. They're still great, but you kind of have to play that first album <laughs> every night. Yeah. And I was really over it. I was really over it. I was like, oh, I can't play seven o'clock. Sex party, I don't know, Rose and Rings, although I love Rose and Rings, but we didn't do that every night. Or just these songs every night, and I was kind of not digging it off. You know, I like the newest stuff we've done on the. There was some great stuff on This Is Rock and Roll, that's a great album. I did the artwork for that one too, as well. I did the. Oh, I, nice. I, I, and I kind of got the artwork together for Well Oiled, which is. A, there's a couple of great songs on Well Oiled, but still, we were having to fill the set with what everyone else, you know, Tramps and Thieves. And, these other songs and I was kind of it was tiring me out I was like oh yeah. I want to do something new which I guess at the t 2005 that was I guess I didn't do and I guess I went you know having the child having the kid and stuff I kind of just did work for a few years and I don't know how long it, it was quite a while before I found anything else to do which would be for a moment the Pecky Cowboys uh -huh. but again that was in England again yeah. So the same problem has come back again. I, just haven't been, I love the Peckin' Cowboys. The first album Guy Bailey did uh -huh. from the Choir Boys, that's how I heard of it. I never did a gig with him, me and him in it together. He kind of backed out of it by the time. Then Mark Eden, the singer, did a second record, 12, 12 10 Towers from the Gin Palace. Mm -hmm. Fantastic album. And that was the one that came out, and I said, oh yeah, I really want to do this. So I went to England about three or four times to do that with Timo. First of all, Daryl Bath was a guitar player, and then Timo jumped in. Mm -hmm. And so I did a bunch of tours and shows with those guys. But again, that was the same silly, silly problem of I was back to doing what I didn't want to do before. Just fly to England all the time, sleep yeah. on someone's floor. And of course, these Peck and Cowboys things were very low budget. Yeah. So I'd stay at Timo's house on the couch. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was all very low budget, and we'd have to get a train or whatever to gigs. It was kind of low budget. It was fun for a few times, but that started to wear a bit thin as well. Okay. So that was the end of that. I don't know what the last time I played with them was. It was probably, I can't remember. I would have to look it up. I don't know when I last played with them. And then there was another gap for a while. I was like, you know what? I kind of went, ah, that's it. I'm done with this again. Yeah. I, just, I just tried this band. It's great, but I have to fly to England. I don't want to do that anymore. And I kind of stopped playing bass for a while. I actually hung them up on the wall, it was a nice display, and I never got it down for a few years. But then that's how the bootless came about, which is a whole number story. Well, do you want to tell us? <laughs> well, I, yeah, again, I kind of, after picking Cowboys, I was like, you know what? I really like the job I do. Am I trying to sabotage myself by getting in the band and then being dragged away from working in production to go mm -hmm. play in England? So I'm missing work and spending money. I was like, it's still too much. I can't do this anymore. So that was the end of the Pecky Cowboys. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, you know what? I just, I've had a really good run here. This is great. I've done all these albums, been in all these bands, done all these things. Maybe it's time just to not do that anymore. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. But little did I know that a few, a year later, we used to go to Mick, Mick Cripps, an old friend of mine for years, uh -huh. back when I was playing with him in England. He has his garage set up so he can jam in it. So, you know, some days we go jam over in the house, play bass, play some covers. Yeah. And then they had a guy singing and he moved away. So no one was, so we were jamming covers and no one was singing. Yeah. I was like, well, this is stupid. And then Nick's brother, Robert, started playing bass. So I go over there and there's nothing for me to do. Hmm. No bass, because yeah. Robert was playing bass, but no one was singing. And I was like, yes. 
So I just, that's how it happened. I was like, well, let me sing a song. I said, can you play something I could sing? So we started doing these songs by a band called Dr. Feelgood from England, which yeah. had a very hard blues sound, fast. Yeah. And the singer wasn't great. He just kind of shouted it out. And I started doing that. And it actually, suddenly one day after doing it a few times, we're like, it doesn't actually sound that bad. I could probably <laughs> get away with this. Yeah. But I did actually take a few singing lessons, which kind of helped because... Oh. Yeah, because um, singing is really weird because if you've never done it, you just got, you just wonder how to do it. Mm. It's hard to explain. Even a singing co vocalist coach would have like, just trying to explain. It's kind of hard to comprehend what they're saying. You're what? You do what? But then if you just keep doing it, I found that oh, suddenly I was like, oh, I can sing now. Yeah. It takes a minute to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so we've done now we've done our second album. We've done two albums for Cleopatra for the Brutus and played. England twice again. That's right. But this time when we go to England, it's just for a set amount of time. Two, go for two weeks, do five or six shows. Yep. That works out pretty good for everybody. So we've been doing that. Nice. And it's funny because we are in the Glendale um, Public Library, mm -hmm. which I don't know if she knew is actually a Brutus building. I didn't know. Yeah. That's really cool. Which is quite a coincidence. I walked up there, wow, under my nose is this beautiful Brutus building. Mm -hmm. Built in 1973. I don't know the architects, but it's pretty cool. Now, um, do you, like, what kind of future ambitions do you have? I mean, are you going to continue with the Brutalist and make another record? Yeah, or? Brutalist yeah. is ongoing. We're uh, just doing, we're just doing another video for, a second video for a song off the second album. Uh -huh. The song's called Price On Your Head, from the album We Are Not Here To Help. Mm -hmm. That'll probably be, this is January now, it's not in January, it's still December, but we're going to, we have to film a little bit more. And finish editing it so that'll probably be mid January that'll come out. Nice. Yeah. Probably my favorite song that you guys have done is Nutter. Oh, you like that? Yeah. I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. That's about a real person. Really? <laughs> yeah. Some crazy girl I met in England. Her oh. name should remain. We won't mention her name. All right. I'm sure she's thanking you. If she's no, she this. probably doesn't realize. She's so stupid. She doesn't realize. <laughs> right. So, anything else you'd like to add? Brutalists, we're not here to help. Great album. Yes. All right. That's it. That's all I can think of. Any more questions? I think we're good for now. I know. My voice is hurting. No, I'm kidding. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I've been talking with Nigel Mock. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Anytime. Bye, guys. Take care.